Your Excellencies, Honorable Prime Cabinet Secretary and Secretary of, of Foreign Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Kenya, Your Excellencies, the permanent representatives of member states of the African Union, the leadership of the African Union Commission, which is here, friends of the African Union, Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Assalamu alaikum. Mes amis, bonsoir. Hamjambo. I am very delighted to see such a big audience here in Addis this evening. And I'm so happy to have been introduced by two very prominent African ladies here. It shows the women power of Africa. <clears throat> Allow me to begin by thanking all of you for making time out of your very busy schedules to come and listen to me and my vision for this great institution, the African Union Commission. I do not take it, your presence here for granted. I know that you have other things that you have prepared to do today. But you chose to come and be with us here. I know some of you may know me as a politician. But allow me to introduce myself to you today. My name, as has been said, is Raila. Amolo Odinga. I'm an African by way of Kenya. Although my ancestors came from a place called Bar El Ghazal in southern Sudan. I am a mechanical engineer by training, a businessman, a former prime minister, a grandfather of five, a father of four, husband of one <laughs> whom, that I know of, <laughs> and a lifelong servant of Africa, but you may call me also Baba. <clears throat> Many of you have heard of me because of politics, which as you know can be a challenging arena full of ups and downs. And throughout my career, I have faced obstacles, but I remain steadfast and uncompromising in my belief about an African unity. I was born up, uh, into the spirit of Pan-Africanism as the son of uh, a pioneering leader, Jeramogi Oginga Odinga. And under his tutelage and guidance, I was exposed to the rich tapestry of Africa's history through the lens of exceptional leaders. I have witnessed both the continent's greatest aspirations and its most challenging trials. I have experienced the vision and dedication of the founding fathers like Nandi Azikiwe, Kwame Nkrumah, Julius Nyerere, Ahmed Sekuture, Gamal Abdel Nasser, uh, uh, Ahmed Ben Bella, uh, and re well, recently, Madiba, Nelson Mandela. I have also lived through the, the collapse of that grand vision and have had occasion to watch how the world rapidly transformed while back at home we are developing at a slower rate. Thankfully, the vision of the modern AU as we know it, it was brought back to life by President Thabo Meki, Lucy Gunabasanjo, Abdullah Wade, and Abdulaziz Butaflika. We thank them for their contributions. Indeed, Africa has given all of us the tools to succeed 
which is why I'm determined to give back to Africa. And we're meeting here today in Addis Ababa. Addis Ababa is not the head seat of OAU, of AU by, by accident. This is the cradle of mankind. By contemporary knowledge of science, the oldest species of humanoid lived around this region here, from Ethiopia down to Kenya. So here, you are back home. And they say that if Adam was the first human being, he was an African. He lived, he lived here. <laughs> this is also the oldest country in terms of governance in the continent. It was the only country that was not colonized. So what you see here is not a relic of any kind of colonization. Apart from a brief invasion by Italians, this country has always ruled itself. And when they came here, they found an institution that was much older and stronger than that they left back home where they came from. So you must be proud that Africa actually is the mother of civilization. When Africans were traveling, were struggling, Ethiopia offered support for liberation of Africa. And the national liberation movement moved and eventually colonialism was defeated. So there were centers, Accra, Cairo, Addis Ababa, Dar es Salaam. Those were the origins of, of, of African organization, African Uni Union. Two and a half weeks ago, we were here in Addis Ababa to come at the launch of the refurbished African Hall, where the Organization of African Uni uh, Unity was, was founded in, 19, in May 1963. At that time, I came under a different category. I was invited as a descendant of my father, who was one of the founding fathers of the Organization of African Union. At that time, a big part of Africa had already been liberated. They were represented by presidents. But there was part of Africa which was not free, Kenya was being one of them. Kenya, Zimbabwe, Zambia, then Rhodesia, Mozambique, Swaziland, now Eswatini, South Africa, Basuto land then, now Lesotho, Bichwana land then, now Botswana, South West Africa, now Namibia, uh, Equatorial Guinea, uh, Guinea Bissau, Sao Tome and Principe and Kavbad. So, in that congregation of the African leaders, presidents, the two people who spoke on behalf of the liberation movements, and that was Nelson Mandela. Jeramogi Uginga Udinga. So now we were invited <laughs> as the descendants of the founding fathers to witness the opening of that hall. That is why I was here last time. Now my extensive travels across the length and breadth of Africa have exposed me to the enormous riches and unexploited opportunities in our great continent. I have also had the opportunity to serve the African Union High Representative for Infrastructure Development in Africa between 2018 and 2023, for which I remain profoundly grateful. But I have also represented the AU in other capacity. When Ivory Coast was in turmoil, the then chair of the AU, Mr. Jean Ping, approached me and asked me to be the African Union representative to mediate the crisis in Ivory Coast. I have also been involved in other peace uh, initiatives in Burundi under Maldimu uh, Julius Nyerere to negotiate peace 
in Burundi. I was also involved in Mozambique when there was a crisis, when the opposition had refused to accept the results and they needed somebody to go and bring them together. I was involved in the negotiations in Mozambique. So I understand Africa from other perspectives. But I was introduced, was asked by the kind chair to uh, be the high representative of Africa on the field of uh, infrastructure. And I know most of the representatives here from that perspective. This position gave me the opportunity to further appreciate Africa's myriad infrastructural uh, and associated challenges. Here, we were dealing with several infrastructure across the continent. We were dealing with Trans-African highways. Because Africa has got a elaborate program, PIDA, Program for Infrastructure Development in Africa, with presidential champions for all these infrastructure projects. But there are several challenges that are being faced. That position gave me the inside story of what needs to be sorted out in the in African Union. We were dealing with Trans-African Highways, the Cape to Cairo, the Tunis to the Cape, the Dakar through uh, uh, Bamako, Khartoum to Djibouti, the Dakar to Lagos, Lagos to Mombasa. Then you have the trans African high speed railway networks from Beira in Mozambique through Zambia DRC to Lobito in Angola and then down to Walvis Bay in Namibia, in Namibia. Then you have the uh, trans African high speed railway, railway again from Lagos through the western coast, all the way to Cairo. Then you have the Lapset, the Lamu port, South Sudan and Ethiopia corridor, which we later on revised to move the railway line from the port of Lamu in Kenya, through South Sudan, the Central African Republic, Cameroon port of Kribi, to create a land bridge that links the Atlantic and Indian Ocean and opening up the interior of the continent to uh, 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 transport and trade. These were major challenges. Then we are dealing also with energy. Africa is the richest continent in as far as green energy potential is concerned. The green energy, the solar, the sun is here from January to, to, to December. Then if you've got geothermal potential in the Rift Valley, then you've got wind potential around the continent. If you've got the hydro, each hydro potential in the continent. These are the areas. In the Inga Dam in Congo, you can generate over 100 gigawatts of power. And then you can use that to supply energy across the continent and lower the cost of energy in the continent. You have got the Southern African power pool, you've got the Eastern African power pool, the Central African power pool, the West African power pool, and the North. And you can interconnect these power pools and bring down the cost of energy to what is uh, 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 acceptable universally. In some places in the continent, like if you go to uh, um, the Gambia, the cost of electricity is 38 US cents per unit. What can you do with that? In some places, it is 4 US cents per unit. 
if you want to be able to process the raw materials that are available in abundance on the continent, you must address the issue of energy acceptability in our continent. And that was one of the issues we dealt with. The issue of uh, high-speed connectivity, uh, fiber optics, was another one to connect all the African capitals so that communication can become much easier and faster and give our people access to the internet. Then the open skies was another issue. Open skies to bring down the cost of air transport on the continent. Africa is huge and the, the infrastructure down on the roads and highways and railways are not yet fully developed. But you have got the skies which are free. You don't need to construct anything. All you need is just construct air, uh, airports and buy uh, planes. That's all. But then there are barriers which have been put there. Each and every country has got their own air traffic control. And to supply the airspace, you have to get a permission and you have to pay. And this makes the air transport so expensive in Africa, where the air transport is mostly needed. The air transport in Africa is much more expensive than it is in Europe. In Europe, they have got one European air traffic control. And once you've been cleared, you can just fly, you only inform the other countries that I'm overflying, and you have no problem. In Africa, you have to wait days to be given a clearance if you are trying to fly with your own uh, 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 aeroplane. The other time, I was trying to fly from Dar es Salaam to Niamey in Niger for a conference. I was holed up in in Dar es Salaam in a hotel for 10 hours because you must get an overflight clearance over Uganda, DRC, Central African Republic, Cameroon, Nigeria, and Niger itself. At that time, I, I was going for the funeral of the president of Namibia. I'm sitting in Nairobi at the airport for three hours to get clearance over Tanzania, DRC, Zambia, Botswana, and Namibia itself. So these are self-imposed restrictions on our continent. This is what we call the low-hanging fruits that you can harvest without a problem. But these are still there as a challenge. These are some of the problems that we were dealing with uh, when I was there. And uh, saying that this means uh, a challenge that we need to deal with going forward. Then, on the continent, we have the youth. The youth is the biggest asset that we have in our continent. The African continent is a young continent because 70% of our youth are below the age of 35. This can be either an asset or it can also be a challenge. Because the youth, if they are not empowered, they become a drug on the economy. They become drug addicts. They become criminals. And they become a drug on the economy. But if they are empowered with Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, our youth are the biggest resource that we have in the continent. But we first need to give the youth the requisite tools that they require to be able to create wealth for our continent. This is 
another major challenge to us. This is what other countries have done. This is what China did. China empowered the youth and gave them skills so that when they opened up their economy, the big manufacturing companies rushed to China because they saw there it's highly skilled and cheap manpower and also cheap raw materials. So you go to China, all the major manufacturing companies are in China. The automobile, Mercedes is there, BMW is there, Volkswagen is there, Peugeot is there, Citroën, Volvo, Ford, Toyota, Nissan, Hyundai, all of them are in, Japan, are in China. In Germany, they tell me it is cheaper to manufacture a Mercedes-Benz in China and ship it back to Germany than the one manufactured in Stuttgart, Germany. That enabled China to move 600 million people from poverty to middle income status. So China is today no longer the cheapest destination because most of the people have become more affluent. A gap is left down there underneath which Africa can fill. Because China has the cheap raw materials, but those raw materials are made with original raw materials from Africa. They have cheap industrial materials. They have got steel, they have got uh, copper, they have got uh, um, uh, uh, aluminium. But all those are made with raw materials coming from Africa. So if you can do the value addition on the continent, then you don't need to, the people don't need to go to China. Those industries will come to Africa and Africa will become the next uh, 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 factory of the world. This is one of the things that I have in mind. This unity has undermined our ability to mobilize our resources, to catalyze the collective dreams of the, co the continent's citizens. Africa's unity is therefore sacred to me. We must return unity to the top of our priorities as Mali Munyerere and Nkrumah did. Without unity in a fast consolidating and changing world, Africa will continue to be marginalized exploited and irrelevant. It is why today I ask you, ladies and gentlemen, to open your minds to a new Africa. Imagine an Africa that is booming with industry, where businessmen and women from Bamako in Mali can take the transcontinental high-speed rail to trade in Kampala, Uganda where the cotton material from Lome in Togo can be bought online by our housewife in Lusaka, where African products can be bought in supermarkets across the world under the name of African brands owned by Africans, and the African workers and farmers are proud of their products. An Africa that does not require visas for other Africans an African men and women who do not climb on a rickety boat or in an airplane cargo hold, risking their lives to uh, go to greener pastures. I envision uh, a continent whose progress is driven by its own people and that pushes to be a dynamic, influential, and respected force in the international arena. And here, again, the barriers which we place on ourselves. My friend Aliku Dangote, one of the most prominent African businessmen, tells me, Raila, it's so difficult to do business in Africa. I need 35 visas to travel across the African continent. Yet my French competitor does not need any visa. 
the French passport can go to all African countries. How then can you compete? How can you benefit by being African? You're being punished because you're an African. These are some of barriers which make us look just stupid. In Europe, when I was living there, traveling in Europe was very difficult. You had to have a visa. When I was traveling from Germany to Britain on a train, I needed a visa to transit through Belgium or Holland, two visas. And if you did not have that visa, they put you back on the, play, the, the train back to where you came from. Today, you don't need a visa in Europe. The Schengen visa, you can go to any country in Europe. You only get, if you're traveling by road, you only get to know that you've crossed the border by seeing the different uh, registration numbers. And so Europe has become a village. Why can you not do that in Africa? I intend to see that we introduce Africa, the AU visas like the Schengen visa. So my leadership at the AU will not be one of the same rhetorics where people meet a few times a year and return to their enclaves. My leadership will be pegged on the dreams of our forefathers who expected that by now Africa would roar in one united voice. So here we know every year there are, there's a general assembly here. The jets come land and they move in here. Coming into these premises is not as easy as you came this today. Today it was easy because you are coming to meet a candidate. Then those days there's a lot of security. Then there's a lot of talk in the halls here. Monsieur le Président, these are that. The resolutions are passed and of the jets will live again at Addis Ababa. I can tell you without fear of contradiction that 93% of these resolutions which are passed here are never implemented. That is by confirmation from Mr. Faki himself. So it has become a talking shop. I intend to change that to ensure that all the resolutions which are passed here are properly implemented. So we will not put anything in the agenda and the resolution if we know it cannot be implemented. And if it's not implemented, we'll have a very good reason to explain why it was not implemented. My vision for the youth is to place them at the center stage and driving force behind the innovation and change. Today, African youth are drowning on ships and boats, rickety boats, trying to get to Europe, going to greener pastures. It's a big shame that we're losing young, energetic people because of the poverty on our continent. So we want, the solution is to change this by creating proper employment opportunities on the continent so that they don't have to leave the continent going to look for jobs where they're not wanted. You're ramped there as a refugee, you're taken there as a, a prisoner. It's a big shame. So these young people will find jobs here. Pick a vibrant city buzzing with energy as young entrepreneurs leverage technology and creativity to build dynamic businesses. With AI, and digital resources at their fingertips. They invent solutions for our unique challenges, transforming agriculture with smart farming technologies, revolutionizing healthcare with telemedicine, and reshaping education through accessible online platforms. Our young minds are not just participants in the global economy. They are leaders, innovators, and change makers. My economic transformation plan envisions an economically transformed continent 
thriving on the richness of its resources and the unity of its people, a continent that not only sustains itself, but is a power, powerhouse of global trade. The African continental free trade area will be more than a policy. It will be a reality. Imagine goods flowing seamlessly across the borders, facilitated by advanced logistics and digital platforms, creating jobs, fostering innovation, and ensuring that no Africa goes hungry. My environmental sustainability plan envisions our rich biodiversity. It is protected and our natural resources are managed wisely. In the face of climate change, we lead the way in renewable energy, harnessing the sun and the wind power to power our homes and industries. Our agricultural practices need to be regenerative, preserving our land for future generations and ensure food security for all. Africa is not the offender in this debate on climate change. Africa is a victim because Africa's emission is less than 5%, about 3%, somewhere there. But Africa suffers the biggest uh, uh, effect in this uh, animal called climate change. Many of African countries today live between two twin disasters, floods and drought. El Nino and the sister La Nina. The floods, when the floods come, they destroy homes. People drown. Our infrastructure is devastated. Bridges are washed and so on and so forth. And when the drought comes, livestock is dying. People go hungry. There's no food, famine, and so on. So first, we need to make our contribution to this agenda of climate change by greening Africa, rolling back the desert. But we are also the biggest arable land available today on the planet Earth. So we make use of those what we have on the continent. But in the negotiations for compensation, if we go as Benin, as Kevad, as Egypt, as Senegal, as Kenya, they just look at you. I have been in those COPs. I was in COP 15, I was in COP 16, I was there in Copenhagen, I was in Cancun, Mexico. I have been in a number of those COPs. I was in uh, Sham el Sheikh. Now I'm not going to um, do back next week. It's, it's, it's back and next year it is in, it is, uh, in uh, uh, Brazil. But it's a talk show. People talk and they keep on pushing you, pushing you. They make promises for billions. But when it comes to contributions, nothing is happening. But if Africa negotiated as Africa, it will be a deep matter altogether. But if you go as individual countries, you will keep on being pushed left, right, and center. And that's why we must have one agenda on this issue, climate change, and say this is what it is, and these are our terms. Gender equality and inclusion. In this ideal Africa, gender equality is not just an aspiration, it is a reality. Women and girls are, are empowered, need to be empowered to pursue their dreams, leading in every sector, from technology and politics to education and business. African woman has made a lot of contribution in history. African woman is the breadwinner in most of African societies. She's the one who wakes up so early in the morning to go 
to the farm, to go and, and farm. The one who is looking after uh, the children at home. She's the one who is also fetching water to bring at home. The one who is cooking in the home. And then in the evening again, she's the one also who is the workshop. So, <laughs> an African woman is a great enemy, a great, a great uh, a human being. African women must be given their rightful space. They must be respected and empowered. They must ensure that their voices are heard in every decision-making process creating a balanced and equitable society. Cultural, cultural renaissance. Let's envision a cultural renaissance in Africa. An African that celebrates its rich heritage while embracing modernity. Our art, our music, our literature resonate worldwide, showcasing our talents and telling our, our stories. Festivals and cultural exchanges thrive, reinforcing our bonds and inspiring future generations to cherish and promote our diverse cultures. Of course, with this ambitious dream, there must be a plan, which is why my, my campaign and my leadership have come up with an extensive technological innovation plan, utilizing artificial intelligence as its bedrock. In this future, we embrace technology as an enabler of progress. Cities are smart, utilizing AI to optimize everything from energy consumption to transportation systems. Education is accessible to all, with digital classrooms that open doors to knowledge regardless of location. Our health systems are strengthened through telehealth and AI diagnostics, ensuring that every individual receives quality care. But fundamentally, my running call is the leadership of Africa, that we join hands and make sure that no African is left offline. Every African should be online. And now let me conclude a call to action. Today I invite each one of you to imagine this Africa, a continent bursting with potential and brimming with possibilities. As I present my candidacy for the position of chairmanship of the African Union Commission, I'm committed to turning this vision into reality. But I cannot do it alone. It will take all of us leaders, innovators, and every citizen working collaboratively to dismantle barriers, foster unity, and pursue excellence. Together, let us harness our collective power to create a future where Africa stands tall on the global stage, an emblem of resilience, creativity, unity. Let us embark on this journey toward a brighter and more prosperous Africa. Africa is the richest continent on the planet Earth in terms of strategic raw materials that have made other parts of the world rich. The paradox is that the richest in terms of resources is also the poorest in terms of living conditions of these people. This is what we need to change so that African people can be rich people. We have been blaming others in the past, but the time for blame game is gone. Now is the time to act as Africans. And we take our destiny in our own hands and we work collaboratively to uplift the living conditions of African people. They are those people who do not believe that Africa can develop. So they are what we call Afro-pessimists. Afro-pessimists are those who think Africa is a lost cause. 
but the upper pessimists like myself, and those who believe in the ability of the African people to develop Africa. Africa will not be developed by foreigners coming to Africa. The foreigners will come to invest, not to develop, but to make money. But ultimately, Africa will be better developed with the, with the brains and energies of the African people. And that's why you've seen the story I tell of the African lion. That African lion is a very resilient animal. And here the African lion is giving a message to the Asian tiger. And the African lion is, as you know, the Africa, the lion is a revered animal. The Cameroonian soccer team is called the Indomitable Lions. The Senegalese soccer team is called the Lions of Teranga. The Moroccan national team is called the Atlas Lions. And in East Africa, we call the lion Simba, Mfalwe wa Musitu. That the lion is the king of the jungle. When it roars, the other animals listen. So the African lion is giving a message to the Asian tiger. That you, the Asian tiger, you have danced alone on the stage for far too long. I was asleep in the jungles of the Congo. But now I'm awake. I'm surrounded by the mighty, mighty uh, mountains of Kilimanjaro and Kenya to the east. The Atlas Mountains to the west. The rivers, the Niger, the Zambezi, the Limpopo, the mighty Congo, the Nile, and I'm sitting on African oil, African gold, African bauxite, African copper ore, African iron ore, African diamonds, and I now have the knowledge and ability to turn all this wealth into prosperity and to liberate my people and make them rich and powerful and claim the 21st century as an African century. <laughs> End of the message of African land to the Asian tiger. Thank you very much. <laughs>